it's time to build the Department of Villainy circuit board and to pass the time pleasantly while I'm building this. I asked the Patreon supporters to give me some questions to answer and they've given me a selection of questions. So what I'm going to start off with doing is I'm going to start with uh, preparing the resistors for this. And to prepare the resistors, I'm going to cheat slightly. One of the questions is, instantly, have you ever considered doing a full walkthrough of the various equipment you use at your bench, including model numbers and why you find it worthy to use? So that was asked by Brian W. Antoine Unicorn. Unicorn. Uh, unicorn. Oh, right. Unicorn. OK, I get it. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, while I'm making this video, I'll describe the things I'm using. Some are very standard and cheap items off eBay. I mean, ultimately, these side cutters are one of the most common things that you, you want to get started. It's like the most essential tool along the sojourn. And I'm going to also use more specialist tools like this RS Components stock number 545-109, probably discontinued now. When I was manufacturing a lot of circuit boards, I used to uh, form a lot of components that seemed to sensible to form them professionally, this unit crops and shapes the component leads. So I'm going to be using it to crop the leads. Uh, one of the first questions then is, oh, how did I get started on YouTube? Why does your channel exist? Asks Carol. Uh, I've answered that before, but it's worth mentioning again. When I first started my website, bigclive.com, it was because I really enjoyed the electronics channels that were the electronics websites that were on the internet it's, it's before YouTube existed. And I've always felt that, you know, in the same way that other people have put content on, it's always good to put something back onto the internet. So I set up a website which was called emanator.demon.co.uk which is not there anymore. Uh, unfortunately, it's effectively Demon that caused problems there. They didn't really update. Well, it wasn't Demon. It was Thus who took Demon over and didn't really allow for future expansion of the internet. So they gave a very low traffic allowance and no upgrade path. So I had to move away from that in the end, which is a shame because the Demon site was, uh, it was prestigious. It was one of the early ways onto the internet. But, uh, Demon Internet, the emanator.demon.co.uk hosted bigclive.com. And it was a website, just random projects. And it looks old fashioned now. It's still there at bigclive.com. But if you look at it, you'll see it. it is basic. It's a snapshot in history. The projects are still interesting and fun, and I suppose, in a way. But the pictures are all small because it did belong to the dial up here. And I've kept it up there in that format, simply because there are still some uh, countries where internet access isn't good and uh, they can't even view many of the modern websites because they're so sluggish because of their data connection speed. But I've digressed, haven't I? The YouTube channel was just kind of set up in the same way. I enjoyed watching other technical channels. Since I was setting up a new bench, this bench here, I thought, OK, I'll, I'll put a wee ledge up here. The camera is still sitting on a little ledge that sticks out from the very same shelf. And uh, that was it. I didn't put it. I didn't start the channel with the intent to become so big, really. I started it just purely because I wanted to give back what I was taking. I was enjoying other people's content. I thought it good to put content back on. That is the spirit of the internet. Things worthy of note here. This is bandoliered resistors. I get my resistors in bulk because I spent a lot of time manufacturing circuit boards. I separate them by just cutting them like this with a pair of scissors. Not your ma's best scissors. And then so they don't go everywhere, I tend to sort of fold it over like this stagger the leads a bit and then do it again but it will you know use your bench scissors the ones that you don't mind lacquering the blades up in because you are cutting metal and that's uh, basically how bigclive.com happened and then obviously you guys liked it and well here it is so let's go on to i should have been actually being more sensible about keeping all the lead, uh, crop leads separate i shall keep the resistors separate let's not mix them all into a pile here next question um, at home, oh, what was that? Oh, yes. 
MT Noob says, why do we use solder connections for electronics but not for residential wiring? Some people have soldered residential connections, but to be honest, it's more likely to, as the heat goes along the thick copper, it's more likely to damage the insulation. I think ultimately, given that houses were traditionally wired before electricity was even on the premises, I think really uh, the, it was the convenience of easy termination into screw terminals. That's gone one step further though with uh, the Wago style terminals, the spring loaded ones, which I kind of approve of. I was a, a bit apprehensive about them at first, but it just, it's easier. And you do get people saying, I soldered all the connections in the house, and you think, oh, that's quite a lot of work. And you wonder, what does it look like? But, um, I would say that ultimately the easiest way for wiring in a sort of mass installation approach is to uh, have just push-in fittings or screw fittings. The plumbing has gone the same way. It started off with copper and soldering, and it's gone in the direction of push-in fittings. Okay, next. Plug and Play OK says, if you could tell me why not why, is that a whip and whip sort of thing? Uh, I suppose it might be cultural differences, the pronunciations of words. John Russell says, I'm interested to know if in the chemical experiment you ran a few months ago of any correlation between a person's eye colour and their type of work. In a sense, there was. If I was to do it again, I would do it with an automated system because a lot of people responded and it was quite hard wading through it. Even just the Patreon supporters uh, initially, before I released it for general use, I did a summary of all the Patreon supporters' eye colours. And there were a few prominent things. Green eyes seemed to be associated with lab work. Blue eyes and grey eyes were often associated with uh, what you might call, well, computers, software, uh, it, internet infrastructure, IT networks. It's just a very strong bias towards computers and the more technical side of electrical and electronic stuff. Brown eyes, it was actually very mixed. It was hard to actually narrow it down. Uh, brown eyes showed a strong physical bias. Um, the same technical jobs, but more hands-on with the tools. And the sort of auburn eyes, is that or hazel eyes, which are kind of intermediate, were indeed intermediate. It was like the what the guys that tend to guys and gals that tend to find their jobs as the troubleshooters in the sort of technical jobs. There was a bias, I think, but I'm not. It can It was skewed. Keep in mind that uh, ultimately the English-speaking community is all going to have sort of bluish, greyish eyes. So that's kind of it. Kind of messes that up. It's not going to be super accurate. It'd be interesting to do it again, but this time so many people had interesting job titles that I'd categorise into groups of particular types of jobs, like lab work, driving, uh, engineering, mechanical, like a mechanic, uh, stuff like that. There's one other component that I think I might form here. And that is this zero ohm link. Now I could just use, there is one link on this circuit board. Um, but I might use this zero ohm link. It looks like a resistor, but it's a single black stripe in it. And that has a resistance of approximately zero ohms. And it's used where machines would place components in. I just used it because it just made it easier for assembly. And it looked quite nice as well, which uh, is kind of important, I think. Used to use it on my commercial circuit boards, zero ohm links. Not sure the construction. I don't know if it's a wire going all the way through or if it's actually just capped onto metalized, a metalized sort of uh, ceramic tube. Not really sure. That would almost make it weaker than uh, a actual link. One more resistor here. Let's crop that. Yeah, this unit, it just made things look neater. Although it was quite fatiguing when you're cutting hundreds of components or thousands of components in some instances. Right, now I'm going to cheat. I'm going to bring in something that's specialist again. A printed circuit board assembly rack. I'm not going to use it for all the components. I'm going to use it for the resistors. Uh, so I shall pop this in like this. This clips in. This came from a company called Veleman. I don't know if it came from Rapid Electronics or uh, Maplin. 
it basically lets you place all the components in like this. Let me start place components in. I'll even put them all the right way around. Well, the same way around, which doesn't really matter at all with resistors, but it just looks quite nice. Next question. Uh, Phil Collins says, the beard, origin, management, and what was the maximum length? Ever thought of shaving it off to confuse people? I, when I was young, I wanted a moustache more than anything else because it was of that era. It was, shall we say, that point I was becoming aware age-wise at the age of five. Would have been 1970. And I really wanted to be a workman for some reason. It's good. That's a good, you know, I think that's built into a lot of us. It's that uh, Bob the Builder type scenario, but the real thing. And I really wanted a moustache. Ironically, the moustache didn't grow for absolutely till I was in about my 30s. It just, it was just like fluff. But yeah, the stubbly, not stubbly beard, it was a fluffy beard again, grew at the point I was at school. And it starts off in the bottom of the chin, then it gradually evolves. And as you get older, the beard height just moves up. And with some people, it's different. Some people have just amazing beard growth at a young age and moustache growth. Others, it takes a long time. And if you want a big beard and your beard isn't growing fast enough, just have patience. It also varies uh, between people genetically. So my beard, uh, I couldn't say how long it would take to grow. I've never shaved it off to grow it from scratch again. So uh, that's it. it. This is oh, also, this is terminal length. The Length you see in the videos, the Manx Beard Clubby type videos, is it. It doesn't go any bigger. It's just uh, Ebdy has a terminal length, and as you get older, it gets a little bit longer. I'm just going right off shot with this here, haven't I? I've cut plenty of resistors. I've got spares. So this is, uh, oh, that is done. Right, okay, I need my zero ohm link. Where's my distinctive zero ohm link? It's there. I could have made this a double sided board. I didn't. It's just the way it works out. Let's put the 10k links in. Next question. Viable plastic replacement. Any ideas? That's hard to say. Ultimately, they're developing. I think the bias should be towards, well, they've, they've already got starch-based plastics, plant-based plastics that do biodegrade. I think that's kind of important. But more importantly, I think it's better to educate people into proper recycling and put up a proper recycling system. And most of all, get rid of those awful drinks bottles. The ones that you don't really want to drink the contents of anyway. They're utterly wasteful. But uh, yeah, recycling and, you know, not combining materials that can't be easily separated, that would be a good start. Oh, you can hear the soldier iron buzzing in the background, by the way. Just thought I'd mention that, just in case you wonder what the buzzing is. You'll hear its transformer kicking in and out. Uh, plug and play OK also says... Energy storage, where's it headed? I'm still thinking that lithium is one of the best options at the moment. I've uh, recently had a bit of an incident with the lithium cell, but not while I was there or not that I was aware of. It was in a metal enclosure. And uh, I'll show you it, in fact. Because it's right here. It's in a explosion containment pie dish. It's a EFEST 3 amp power, supposed to be capable of deliver 10, 20 amps. The heat shrink here has sort of gone in like that. There's a wee dent to the edge. I think that's just where the heat shrink went in and, and not causing the dent. I think it's just a dent that's been there. On the other end, uh, there's definite a scorch mark around the plastic here. I'm not sure what's happened. It might be the device it was in has shorted out. I don't think it was the fault of the cell, but I don't really know. I shall be unwrapping the cell, the outer plastic on it, just to take a look and see if there's any obvious damage. And I'll also be uh, taking a look at the item it was in, taking that apart. I'm disappointed. It was my favourite head torch. It was uh, one that uh, has the sort of functionality of the sort of... You wave your hand in front of it to turn it on and off, but it uh, takes the 18650. It was a good light. that I use it a lot did use it a lot. Now it smells odd and has melted plastic inside. I'm noticing some of these 10k resistors from different batteries. Some of thick bands and some of thin bands. Some are saying, why don't they just print the number on the resistors? The answer is that uh, the 
colour band goes all the way around the resistor, so no matter what direction you see it from, you can read the code off it. And once you get used to reading these codes, it's very easy. So that is all the 10k resistors in, that's all the 1k resistors in, the link, let's soda. Oh, there's one other component I'll stick in. It's the 1N4001 diode for polarity protection. I always uh, put that in because someone is going to connect the supply up wrong. And the only current it has to deal with is the current to the microcontroller control circuitry and not the actual high current side of these MOSFETs that are going down here. So now, I'm going to put this cover over the top of this. I'm going to latch it down at the side, flip it over, and then start soldering. And get more questions. Glass Monster says, do you like Lego? Does MD not like Lego? Lego is uh, one of those creative toys that just kids, some kids, just really like because it lets them build things. I found it slightly less capable of uh, doing the sort of things that I wanted to build. I wanted to build more technical things. Things that vended chocolate bars and things like that, like coin-operated slot machines, and it's not actually ideal for that. Right, let's uh, go down soda one lead at a time on these. There is the link. Make sure I get every pad, although at the end of the circuit board I will be just going over these and just checking everything's done. They all have cooled a bit, so I shall let go and solder the other terminal. That's a resistor for the LED. These will be the biggest pads because they've got the, a fair amount of heat sinking through the track for the resistors. This frame is very useful. I'm not going to use it for the whole assembly though. Um, let me think. Questions. Let's grab another. Uh, Richard Down says, what's the biggest electrical equipment you've ever worked on, both power rated and actual size? I'm sure you've spoken about it before. Um, it's probably the substation equipment at the steelworks because that was just monstrous. It, it ran places like particularly the Ravens Creek Steelworks in Scotland because uh, it didn't just power the steelworks and all the furnaces, but it powered the arc furnaces as well. It basically distributed the power out to them. And to give you an idea of the scale of it, when you were in the substation, there were ducts underneath and you could be standing on the cables and they were like drain pipes. They were like a huge diameter, 150 mil, six inch diameter, just really big cables that uh, goodness knows how the guys actually installed those. The company I served my apprenticeship with was a specialist in steelwork uh, work. They installed uh, the equipment in steelworks and also maintained it. So they had teams there all the time at the main Scottish steelworks and used to travel uh, to do work at the English steelworks as well. It was a very interesting apprenticeship. Very, very heavy. I think Ebdy picked up minor injuries or... Yeah, or major injuries, as the case may be, from just the nature of the work. It was nice because you got danger money, and when you're young, you don't really consider it as being dangerous, but now looking back, you think, yeah, there was always a risk that, you know, there was going to be a furnace explosion or something, or spraying of molten metal out in a random direction. You can see all those videos on YouTube. It's just uh, when things do go wrong and just narrowly miss people, just because that's the nature of the... The beast when you're dealing with sort of steel. I like the steelworks. I like them a lot. Uh, next question. Is there any technical area you are especially interested in, says L3P3? Uh, right. And what were those interests in different ages? For me, it is trains and computers. I'm not really into the blinky LED gadgets and cars. But, uh, yeah, okay. I've always loved slot machines from a very young age, from the old electromechanical ones to the uh, video game era. But if anything, I'd say I was quite fond of the electromechanical stuff. You can find, again, lots of videos about that on the internet. 
the the midway used to make the old uh, gallery games and because they didn't have the facility of video game technology at that time they improvised and they created games that were almost as good as video games but not quite as versatile as a video game because you were just you were limited to uh, what you could actually how many scenes you could have just by the technical space and the complexity Let's grab some more soda grabs the wrong bit of soda and pulls a huge length off the reel but yeah I do love the old arcade machines the electromechanical stuff I like the way it sounds the cam switches inside and all the rotating wheels and contacts Um, anything else that would interest me that way? Sure. I've always had an obsession with work overalls, different ones from different countries. I just think kind of find them kind of interesting. I guess that ties into the image when I was young that I just wanted to work and the overalls became symbolic of that. And still are. I still buy far too many overalls off eBay. eBay, it's, it's just full of stuff. Including some really vintage stuff, uh, vintage overalls. It's quite nice to occasionally get them just to see the different styles. It also has those vintage arcade games. Many of those games uh, were a bit shady electrically as well. I've got a coin pusher uh, that uh, has a lovely 350 volt DC protection circuit, alarm circuit. I didn't realise that until I touched it. It had low voltage type contacts being used with absolutely not low voltage whatsoever. Right, for a special treat, I'm going to use my posh Xeron snips. So that's me more or less finishing the frame. That was uh, handy for putting the resistors in. Let's put that out the way, see if I can cause an avalanche over there. Where are my Xeron snips? The difference between the Xeron snips and the cheapy Chinese ones is the Xeron are precision engineered. So they're actually, these ones in particular are designed to provide a flat cut. So whereas if I cut it with this one, it will leave a sharp edge. If I cut the other lead with this one, it leaves a soft top. It leaves a, a, a very flat top. It's quite interesting the way they achieve that because they achieve it by deliberately misaligning the blades very slightly, but in a precision manner. And it works very well. These are nice. They're a lot more expensive than the cheapy ones, but you get what you pay for. For most of you starting out in electronics, or for those of you just doing generic electronic stuff that aren't too fussed about being able to rub your hands sensuously in the circuit board, the cheapy Chinese ones will do fine. They're, they're used in bulk in China. The Chinese, of course, mass produce circuit boards on a daily basis, and they use those very tools. They even use the soldering iron I'm using. There, I've seen some videos where there's someone sitting there all day long with that same type of soldering iron. I wonder how many bits they get through in it. Or I wonder how many whole soldering irons they get through. I guess the fact they're widely used for manufacturers is what makes them so cheap. It is, after all, a huge business in China. Right, that's uh, all the resistors in position. I'll sweep that out of the way. There are some spare resistors of both types. I just cut plenty. Right, the next component, uh, size-wise, I'm going to put in is the... Well, let's put the regulator in. I'm using a 7805 regulator. It's quite old-fashioned. It's traditional. I'm also going to... I've pre-bent it. Uh, I'm also going to screw that down with... Uh, whereas I had a washer as well. I've misplaced the washer. Have I misplaced the washer? There's the washer. A little spring washer, just to grip it. Uh, so where's my little screwdriver? I'm going to put a screw through from the back. Oh, no, I'm not. Right. One moment, I've just suddenly realised. I have... Uh, I've got uh, tracks in the vicinity of that, so I can't just put the screw through there without some sort of insulator. Uh, just give me a second here. Let's go into the... Hardware box and find I've got a choice. I'll use a little red fibre washer or I could use a plastic screw. 
both would work. In this case, I'm going to use a fibre washer. That should still give plenty of clearance. It's quite low voltage across that anyway. I don't even need to screw this down. It just kind of looks neat. The reason I'm using the traditional 7805 and the full current one is because uh, I could use a 7L05, a little tiny one, and just have it freestanding. But this one just allows for the possibility. I, I was originally going to include LED indicators in this, and that would have boosted the current up a bit. So uh, I didn't do that, but I kept the big regulator. It doesn't really matter. It's fine. Let's solder the big regulator. This takes the 12 volts in, and it regulates it down to... Oh, let's not bridge the solder across. I keep hitting that. Let's... Uh, Try to get this from the other side. It regulates it down to 5 volts. The next thing I'll do, since I'm now really just concentrating all the support components, another component of a similar size is going to be the socket. I'm using a turned pin socket because it's just better quality. It's uh, better than the sort of punched... Uh, folded strips. Uh, all the kits I make uh, go out <clears throat> with these. In the past, my fairground controllers, it was always a bit annoying that I couldn't use these turn pin and the power cards for the opto isolators because uh, I couldn't... Uh, I've used a much thicker circuit board, an unusually thick circuit board for extra strength in those controllers. And all the ones you could get from RS had short pins that wouldn't actually have protruded through enough to solder properly. So uh, I'm going to check. I've soldered a corner pin of each side, diagonal corners, and uh, it looks flat, so I shall solder the rest of the connections on that. Uh, questions? Hold on. Luke Sargent says, as a budding hobbyist repair person, is there a standard logical series of diagnostic procedures that could test for, say, the top five most common faults in basic household electrical items? Well, the number one fault is probably the power supply, and that doesn't always just uh, involve the power supply in the product. You, The first thing you should do if you have a faulty appliance is check if there's a fuse in the lead. Change the lead if it's a plug-in lead, because it's not uncommon for just a faulty lead to make an appliance faulty and the service engineer comes out, no power there, and then, you know, swaps the lead and that's it, just plugs a new one in. After that, the once you get on board and you've got power coming into the, cir the circuit board in the machine, it's most likely the uh, power supply, because uh, it gets subject to the most physical, electrical abuse usually. And that, uh, depending on the type, it could be a traditional transformer type power supply that the thermal fuse has failed in it. Or it could be uh, a switch mode power supply that the output capacitor has failed and it's, it's doing that's a hiccup thing or the output diode. Or it could be a capacitive dropper where the capacitor is degraded and you just have to then sort of analyse the nature of the fault and uh, follow it through. Right, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is the decoupling capacitors. There's one either side, there's one on the 12 volt rail and one on the 5 volt rail. All they do is they act as a little tiny reservoir so that any super sharp glitches and transients in current will be uh, buffered by that tiny little reservoir. It's only 100 nano. To be fair, you probably don't need it, but I prefer to use it anyway. It's traditionally used. One on the 12 volt input, one on the 5 volt output. And the one thing you never do is put a decoupling capacitor between the 5 volt and 12 volt rails, because that is actually a coupling capacitor. I did that accidentally in a design. Couldn't work out why every time I really energized, the processor crashed. And the answer was because every time they really energised, the sudden spike it produced was being coupled directly onto the 5 volt line. The processor did not like that sudden change at the logic level and would misinterpret what was happening and it would crash. Uh, another thing to note there is never sharing microcontroller supply lines with high current loads. Run their, Even if it means running two identical tracks next to each other, it's better to keep them separate. Now, I also have a little uh, buffer capacitor here 
and I mark down 22 megafarad 35 volt. I'm going to use 100 megafarad 25 volt just because I think it's more suited to the task. It's also a bigger, chunkier capacitor, and I like that. And that's why I'm going to do it. It just looks nicer. And will possibly have some advantage. So I'm just going to solder one of those pins. Then I'm going to make sure it's looking pretty without actually bending it so much I rip one of the leads out. That's looking all right. And then I'll solder the other pin. So this just acts as a little buffer. There's a mini power supply in this. I've not explained what this does yet. It's for animating LED strips. Uh, sort of Christmassy style. So you can program a sequence. It's five, 15 channels with theoretically up to two amps each, but that is going to result, it's going to need uh, a buffering, a little buffer wire run along here, a little bus bar wire. And likewise, this uh, track here has pads for beefing it up if needs be but for the current because uh, trying to run all the current across the track just results in problems. You end up with a really thick uh, track area. And also by adding a wire with more thermal mass, it means that if something gets short circuited in any way, it's not, it's going to blow a fuse. It's not going to blow the track instead. So what have we got here? Let's put the LEDs in. Now I've got one red LED at the top to show the five volts there. I like diagnostic LEDs. Uh, it's always useful being able to just glance at a circuit board and see if something's present or not, like a supply voltage. So I'm using uh, a traditional red LED, gallium arsenide red LED for the five volts. And I'm going to use, unusually, because I've used 1K in the series of the 12 volt supply, with with LED, I'm going to use an old-fashioned, I'm not going to use a gallium nitride LED, I'm going to use an old-fashioned gallium phosphide. That's the type, well, let me show you. Let's plug it into a tester at a sizzling 20 milliamps, and yeah, that's dull, isn't it? Normally, if that was a g proper gallium nitride modern LED, it'd be super bright, but these are just indicator LEDs. It's the older technology. And it's more reliable. It's more robust. It doesn't use that thin film technology that is the curse of gallium nitride LEDs. It's much more rugged. It will withstand static discharge. And, well, it will just last forever, really. Let's make sure that is sitting level. Yes, it is. Theoretically, you shouldn't butt LEDs right down onto the circuit board like this. But I'm going to. I've never really had a problem with that. If this was a mass-produced commercial product, yes, I'd probably raise the LEDs up. Right, the next thing I'm going to do... Oh, tell you what, let's put in this. This is an electronic fuse, and I've got more on here. In fact, I screwed up the design. This one is purely for the control circuitry. It's, in out. Uh, it's just an easy way of adding a fuse on board. And this is a polyswitch type fuse. It's a positive temperature coefficient thermistor. And it behaves like a slow-blow fuse. And if a fault does occur it gets hot because it's got a start starting resistance and then as the resistance gets higher it dissipates more power and it gets hotter and basically speaking that causes an avalanche effect until it locks into a, a particular current level state a particular resistance that's just enough to keep it at that balanced temperature it's, it's trip temperature and it means that when you turn the circuit off, if the fault's gone, when you turn it back on again, it will just self-reset once it cools. It's just a nicer approach than natural traditional fuse. So, shall put this up here because I think my focus here is somewhere down here. Right, the next thing I'm going to do is blow my nose. I should have actually had a cup of tea handy. I think I still have a, a cold cup of tea handy. One moment, I'm just going to grab that if it is there. Yes, an ice-cold cup of tea. Excellent. Uh, I shall partake of my ice-cold tea. The tea has been partaken of. Next thing that's going in is the connectors along the side. Now, I like these rising clamp terminal blocks. They're really expensive. It comes in a strip of 36. I could just buy cheap connectors. I've always just preferred these ones. 
and you can cut them to size. Now, I don't know if this knife is going to be too sharp, because uh, if it is too sharp, it can cause, if the blade's too new, it can actually damage the connectors. But you basically slice them a bit, and then you can snap them apart. Hopefully this is relatively in focus, because uh, as I say, I did kind of focus up here a bit. I could focus down lower. I may do that in a moment. So I need five at six wide, because uh, I've allowed for uh, two terminals for every channel, a common uh, positive bus and then the switch negative bus. Uh, so here is the last of the six way and now for power in I've got uh, a four way I do like these terminals they're expensive but it's worth it they're the rising clamp ones that as the you tighten it it doesn't just mush a wee, plas a wee metals plate down onto the wire or scrunch into the wire it actually pulls a little locking uh, cage up that grips the wire I just think it's better Going to put that in there. I will actually focus down once I've got this on the table. And you're about to realise that I fucked up. I, I've i got a position for PTC thermistors, uh, electronic fuses in every output. I didn't realise that the ones that, that I was specifying, I should have noted the size of them, are a bit bigger than I expected. Uh, they're 2 amp. I may downsize that for the final application because I don't think it's going to be 2 amps per channel. But it is what it is. I can hack them in. I can actually just angle the leads. It just makes it look a bit cheesy. Right. Let's focus down onto this level. How is that looking? That's looking pretty good. I'll just... I'll be careful I won't actually run my finger right over to the edge and then basically stop it recording like I did recently. Now, where is the solder for the these? I'm going to use a larger gauge solder for these. And I'll have to take my time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder one middle pad on each of these. This is where in the old fairgroundy days, when I made the controllers, I had really high mass solder joints because I actually flowed the solder to strengthen the sort of connection to the bus between the wire and the actual triac terminal. Because I used to use these uh, in the fairground line controllers uh, to catch the, to actually clamp onto the triacs, the leads of the triacs. It meant they were very, very easy to change in sort of situ. And they had built in LED diagnostics. But it meant that uh, it would get really, you had, even with uh, a fairly high powered iron, you had to wait for it to heat up again, so it kind of slows you down in that regard. So uh, I'll solder a bag pad, and that is huge. It's going to take a wee while for the solder to flow into that. And then these pads are much easier, because they get lower thermal mass. But the iron is still actually going to have to heat up between them. So this could take a while. Just uh, you have to be patient with it. Because if you aren't, uh, it will ultimately lead to problems with dry solder joints and the risk that when you tighten the screw terminal up it will break that solder connection. The reason I added two ways for the positive and the negative here, just common together, is partly to allow the use of two wires to carry that current if it's going to be really high current. You can get power supplies like the Meanwhile, power supplies that have two flexes coming out of them where you've got a very high current uh, output. They just use two standard flexes, and that means both flexes could go into this. But it also, it does another thing. It means it's a nice solid connector. Uh, just using a couple of bits in their own is very prone to damage when you're tightening it up because there's no real major support just because there is one or two bits of terminal. Questions? Um, oh, L3P3 says, third and last question, oh yeah, there is a fourth question, do you have any dreams that could be fulfilled with a bit more money? Would you behave any different, would you invest your time into anything different if you had a lot more money? To be honest, I'm quite happy as it is, I'm not a very expensive individual.
I have low living costs because I don't really have any need for anything fancy. I wouldn't really want to buy a flash car if I was going to buy any new vehicle. It would be a Ford Transit van. Ford Transit because they're the only van that I actually fit in with my long legs and big feet. Other vans, particularly Mercedes, are notable for just being awful for tall people. I, when I bought my transit van, the one my brother Alfie drives in his, in his less than desirable business uh, in Bamming, uh, for funeral directors, uh, that van, when I bought it, I went round all the different van companies and sat in the vans and tried them out. And I remember the first one that I went into, I'm going to let this just heat up, recover a wee bit. I could have nudged the heat up to cheat, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I remember going into the first one and the salesman there, uh, I said, do you mind if I go out and just sit in the van? And he said, oh, no problem. And I went out and sat there and he said, I was saying, oh, like the steering wheel was right down hard against my knees. And also there was a steering column right through between the feet, but not centrally. It was really awkward for my size of feet. And he said, oh, that's OK. The, uh, the steering wheel can uh, adjust up. Do you want to buy it? And uh, I was like, oh, so can you show me how it adjusts up? And then he was like, mumble, mumble, oh, oh, it's up at full. And it was like, no, then I'm not going to buy your van. And then I went and tried the others and they were more or less the same sort of thing. They were just not geared up. They were geared up for putting lots of stuff in the back of the van, but no driver comfort. And that's something that Ford has always taken fairly seriously. I'm not sure the modern vans are. I'd have to try it again. If I was going to buy a new van, it would, uh, I'd have to sit in it just to see it for size. But my, I'd be confident the Ford ones would uh, put emphasis on driver comfort. So these are the sort of connections that are taking the longest. Uh, L3P3 also says, the fourth of my three questions, your aisle is popular in Germany for stealing off tax money from other European countries. Many airplanes, companies are registered there. What is the main economic pillar of the Isle of Man? It is not electrics, is it? The Isle of Man is really odd. It is an offshore thing, but although I suppose tax evasion does occur by companies putting their offices here, it's not the capital of tax evasion by any stretch of imagination. Uh, June said that the taf capital for tax evasion, one of the biggest capitals in the world, is London. Uh, because uh, it's full of, well, it's got Westminster there, which is just basically a very good example of, yeah, people involved in fraudulent activity. The Isle of Man does have some industries. Your kettle connector and switch may be from the Isle of Man, from Strix, who have a local factory and they still actually employ people here. He said Clive almost with surprise. I've just uh, flooded soda over a pad there. But they also have a major aerospace injur in injury, injury, uh, industry. Uh, it's a really odd selection of industries. Uh, one of the companies near here uh, does all the media for American football games, things like that. It's really strange how some companies have such diverse interests here. Right, next thing is the MOSFETs. MOSFETs. I have lots of MOSFETs. I get through a lot of MOSFETs. At this point in time, to get more serious, because the, the MOSFETs are theoretically a bit more static sensitive, although I don't think they're that static sensitive. I'm going to use this uh, conductive plastic to lay them down on, so I'm, I'm going to have to adjust the legs and all the MOSFETs. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five. These are STP thirty six NF O six L MOSFETs. I couldn't even tell you how many thousands of these I've used in my life. I've got these plastic carriers. I've just got stacks and stacks of them because I get through a lot of MOSFETs, and that's just uh, my standard MOSFET. Now, because I wanted to have a bus bar up middle here, I have, the leads won't go in. It's a set of thing that, you know, although these are rated for quite high current, the, the legs are very close together and you could just compromise on the pad size, but I prefer to actually kick the leads out a bit. And I'm suddenly realising at this point in time that I don't have the ideal 
I don't have the ideal pliers for doing that, but this will do if I'm subtle. What else could use here? Let's, uh, another thing I could use is these uh, desoldering tubes. Because uh, if I stuck these over, this might, I'm not sure, this may not work. This may just make a mockery of me. No, it's actually done quite well. These are little stainless steel tubes that are designed for desoldering. They're like hypodermic needles. But you desolder, uh, you heat the solder up and you slide them over a component lead and it goes through the solder to the component and then you let it cool down and because it's stainless steel it doesn't attach to the solder. Let's see how that did. That did splendidly. Okay, let's uh, form some leads. So yeah, the Isle of Man is not actually... Uh, great for tax evasion. A lot of people with a lot of money come here uh, and unfortunately that means there's a huge wealth divide on the island. It means that, you know, for every billionaire on the island there's a lot of people that are pretty much homeless. It's a really, it's quite extreme. This is great for forming leads. This is the first time I've tried this. It works. It's very precise. Pretty good. I like that. So I shall form all the leads. And it's kind of easier than using those big uh, long nose pliers. Next question. Ah, Jamie Craig says, how do you carry out safe isolation? I'm training as a gas engineer and I've been taught to sweep with a non-contact volt pen and then do dead live dead check with a two pole voltage continue to test of what's your thoughts. That's more or less correct. Using the uh, a good check to see if something is live is to use the non-contact test that just detects electric fields. However, they're not infallible, but they're the sort of thing that, you know, before you even take the lid off something, you can check if there's live uh, supply present to it. Uh, the two-pole tester, we're talking test lamps here. I'd recommend getting a set of decent test lamps for doing electrical work. They don't have to be too fancy. It's helpful to indicate voltage levels because it can actually show when you've got high resistance problems or you've, not, you've got uh, something coming through another load or bad contact. Um, but when you test with your test lamps, and you want them to put a decent load on as well, you want them to light LEDs and stuff like that. When you test with test lamps, it's important to note that even after you've tested and you've found everything is dead, if you ever split two wires, like a couple of lives or neutrals in house wiring, you have to retest to ground to make sure that the a neutral, split neutral, isn't actually acting as a return path for another circuit elsewhere and could theoretically then, once you've opened it, it breaks that circuit and then the full current going through that load uh, is there at that neutral. And if you were to detach two neutrals and then grab both of them, you'd then find yourself in the path of that current and that catches a lot of people out and it won't necessarily trip the RCD or GFCI uh, unless there's a, a, a decent path to earth, unless you were touching, touching something earth at the same time. But in reality, in many instances, you would get a significant shock um, and like full on muscle clamping shock, as in potentially fatal shock, uh, just off the supposedly ground level neutral just because of that leakage current. I think John Ward did a video about that. Uh, stolen neutrals, where somebody has miswired something or not miswired something, but often where someone's miswired something and just stolen a neutral from another circuit without actually properly tracing them out. Yeah, this little tool's great for this. It's not its intended purpose, but it's just great for these. Right, let's stick them in. So these uh, are STP36 NF06Ls. They're fairly chunky. They're almost old fashioned. They're hex fets. They're called hex fets because of the shape of the internal structure. And the L at the end, STP36 NF06Ls, uh, STP36NF06L, the L means logic level. That means they're optimized for being driven from a microcontroller like this directly. And you could theoretically drive the gate pin directly from the microcontroller, but I like to use a 1K resistor in series because uh, it protects the microcontroller. 
from excessive current if something terrible goes wrong. It also means that you're not going to, when it turns on, it's not going to see a very high current spike because uh, each of these acts at a little capacitor and then put, uh, and it's, you know, it's not going to be a massive current spike, but it just, it, I just prefer using those resistors. It means that one faulty MOSFET is unlikely to drag the rest of the circuitry down if it did something horrible like backfeed and blow up the microcontroller. It could still damage the microcontroller because all the res resistor is going to do is limit current. If the circuitry had a Zeno uh, power symbol, Zeno power supply, I'm not sure how this is going to, I'm not sure how the 7805 would actually deal with a, a, an excess voltage on the 5 volt side. I don't think it's really intended to clamp it in any way. But um, if it did have a, a Zeno or Zeno, then that would try and clamp the supply. It would keep the voltage down near 5 volts, even though the, the MOSFET had gone faulty and uh, was backfeeding. It's a fairly common thing with tri direct drive triacs that the resistor to them will blow up and uh, then take out the, it'll, you know, the tr when the triac fails, a lot of current will flow into the control circuit. That uh, happens with some transistor drive circuits as well. More so in the old days and older circuitry. Uh, MOSFETs are a veritable miracle. They're great. So I'm going to turn this over now. And I'm going to solder the middle pin of each MOSFET. I'm going to switch back to the thin solder for this. I find more control with the thin solder. I'm going to turn that like that. And I'm just going to solder the middle pin of them. And then I'm going to adjust them to make sure they're all completely level. So that uh, testing and the other thing is to make sure you do test your test lamps. Because uh, you should prove your test lamps are working each time you test them. Although that doesn't always happen when... You're nowhere near potentially a live connection to test them on. And also when, you know, you're under the pressure of actual work and you don't have time to follow lots of random rules made up by an office worker who never does electrical work in their life. Yeah, some of the rules and regulations in the UK are very, very odd. They're not based in reality. Uh, questions? Oh, Kermie de Frog, Ribbit, says, Is neon bending a nice job? You mentioned your friends who are neon benders. How did they start out? Is it even possible to work in such a niche and presumably low demand market? I would not recommend doing neon bending as anything other than a hobby. And unfortunately, in the past, it was very much a family, it was handed down from father to son. Last time I had neon made, it was made by. Nori's son there. Nori used to be the neon bender at neon workshops in Glasgow. Uh, and uh, when he retired, his son took over. And I think that is the last time I'd neon made. It's, it's a long time since I've had custom tubes made because it's really hard to get it done these days. And Ebd is going for LED because ultimately you don't have to worry about the high voltage side of it. You don't have to worry about those expensive transformers. I'm just trying to line these up roughly equal. It's not that critical. That'll do. Um, ultimately, when it comes to crunch, LED is a lot cheaper. It doesn't have the appeal of proper glass neon, but uh, it does have... I'm just going to make sure these are all the right way around. Just check in. Just check, they're fine. Uh, it, the... Traditionally, it's got that particularly distinctive look, but it's so fragile. And it's also very critical in the manufacture. Too many times I had uh, neon suppliers. Just give me a second, just grab more solder. Neon suppliers who weren't maintaining their pumping equipment, theoretically, and even Nori was a bit guilty of this, you're supposed to use a diffusion pump to bring the vacuum down to a very low level. And if you don't do that, tubes will blacken over time. They won't last as long as a properly processed tubes. And certainly Norris used to blacken up quite <laughs> quickly because he wasn't using the proper diffusion pump after his main pump, which was a bit annoying. But uh, when you have limited uh, sources of neon, that's it. So great... Uh, 
a hobby if you've got all the equipment and it costs a lot for that you'd be better actually yeah. getting in with an actual knee and bender if you could find one too and asking them if they could show you the the trade but uh, they might not be willing to do that it is very cliquish and also it's their job and you know they're not necessarily wanting someone hanging around all the time with them but the equipment needed is quite specialist uh, you need a thing called a bombarder at the pumping station where it passes about an amp at extremely high voltage through the tube to actually heat the tube up just by the vacuum inside it much higher current than it would normally run at uh, in normal operation but it's needed to actually process the tube and actually burn all the impurities out of it so that's why ultimately neon is becoming an architectural material it's very much it's always had a role in architecture but now it's becoming just uh, too specialist in a way but that's because it's kind of specialist it appeals to certain designers who want to exude importance by having a rare and expensive material but it's not fun for the installers modern installers who don't understand me and it's not a, it's not a good ride at all you really have to understand the characteristics of how even parallel runs of cable can introduce capacitance that results in uh, every time the tube strikes in each half wave uh, it can on a traditional 50 60 hertz transformer it can cause that capacitance can cause blackening of the electrodes and also in the high frequency supplies, you have to keep that wires well away because the high frequency means that uh, you tend to get capacitive coupling between them and, uh, and very high risk of corona discharge between them, which uh, results in erosion of the insulation and ultimately fire. Yeah, I like neon, but these days LED is a good choice where you can't have the real thing. Right. The MOSFETs are all now in, it's starting to feel chunky and heavy, that's good. And now uh, I'm about to do the bit that I really messed up. The PTC thermistors, the poly switch fuses, which are rated at uh, 2 amps, but they won't trip until probably close to about 4 amps. The circuitry and the wiring is all designed to cater for this. Um, I like to play safe. The two amps allows me to drive a significant length, maybe about three or so meters of the neon rope on the set of LED neon on an output. This might be slightly out of focus just because I brought it up a wee bit higher. My ideal camera would be in focus for a huge distance, but uh, there's always a trade-off between whatever you use. A huge depth of field. Right, I don't need this anti-static thing anymore because the things are in the circuits that are less susceptible. Right, okay. Uh, let's do the poly switch circuit protection. And here is, where is it, where is it? Where is my prototype one that I've already bent? There it is. You see, I didn't realise these were so big and they're going to go down here. And it's just not quite going to fit. Also, I was going to have to bend the leads anyway because I need to straddle the bus bar here. Okay, I also need to remove some solder from there because I, I've flowed the solder on. Let's bring in my... There's another tool. I could use the desoldering wick. I could use a desoldering pump. This one is an expensive one. It's the Engineer SS-02 Solder Sucker made in Japan. And it's a bit more expensive than others, but it is nicely engineered. It's not one of the cheapy plastic ones. This is where I completely mess up its use and make it look bad. No, I didn't. It's all right. This is also where I'm sucking solder out of one of the plated through holes. Although it's a single-sided circuit board, it does have plating through. Right. So where is the one that I'd already bent? There it is. Is that looking pretty? No, it's not looking pretty, but to be honest, once it's in, nobody will see. Uh, if I can get it in. Okay. I don't want to put any pressure on these as well. These are, in by their very nature, if they do interrupt a fault, they'll thermally cycle, so they'll get hot. So that uh, spacing looks all right. So I'm going to just check. I'm going to pull this one out and use it as a template. 
and I'm going to use this little pin thing again and I'm going to do them all the same way being very careful not to stress the body of the component is that about right? I think that's about right I'm just going to try that in this makes so much extra work when you've not got everything uh, just dropping straight in as with the correct pin pitch but it doesn't really matter. It's happened and it's fine. I'm not going to re-engineer the circuit board just for that. If I was manufacturing another batch, then yes, I would. Looks all right. Um, that's why it's an advantage. I often uh, prototype uh, up to copper. Um, I'll make a prototype circuit board. And uh, that, that's the big advantage of that. You know, you'll actually, when you place the components on, even if you make a cardboard, stick it onto foam, uh, print it out on paper, stick it onto foam, and pin it down, then place the components in, that's when you'll find things like this. But I designed the circuit board and sent it off before I even ordered these components, so I didn't realise that they were going to be quite so tricky. This one, the resin's coming much further down the legs. That's skewing me here. It's a... Uh, making me mess up a little bit because of the distance I was folding it from the, the body. Yeah, the, the electronic fuses are very good. I can remember when they first came out. I was really impressed. I use them in most of my electronic stuff that uh, needs protection just because it means if something goes wrong on the site, then all they need to do is turn the power off and it will reset. It means there's no need to have people putting inappropriate fuses in. Because people do that. They put in fuses that are absolutely not the correct rating and then they blow chunks off circuit boards. These are the uh, fuses, the electronic fuses, that for some reason there was a burp in uh, CPC's ordering system and I actually got some elastic bungee hooks instead. I wonder if it was just something was uh, put in the wrong storage bin. Questions? Questions uh, like... Benjamin Hall says... How did the Fanny Flambo smoke and hot pussy gang concept come to light? It was just a random thing. I saw this doll and I just thought, you know, it just, I'm always thinking things like this. I thought it'd be funny, a doll that explodes in flames. And I thought it'd make quite a funny video for YouTube and I kind of knew it would go viral. And when you make it, uh, you do have to try and, it's best in a single take. And that was a single take without any rehearsal. It's just a few, bit of preparation. Um, so the single take approach uh, for something like that is much more natural. You're going to get, it's going to be more realistic and you're not trying to force fake laughter or things like that or the surprise. I did fake the surprise to be fair. Obviously I knew the doll was going to explode. The expression of my face when it does shoot flames out is based firmly on the what's up? advert, the beer advert, when it's the guy getting served uh, sushi. And the guy said, the guy serving him says, wasabi. And he says, wasap. And then the guy brings a meat cleaver down. It's the expressionist face at that point is firmly what the, it's a good example of, uh, it just, uh, it caught this sort of element of surprise and horror. So that's what that was based on. Right, let's uh, solder some of these in. We're almost ready. I have a chip with software. I have LED neon handy. I should have brought the LED neon through. I shall be soldering these in one at a time and soldering one leg at a time to try and line these up. So it's going to take a wee bit of time. As always, you're welcome to skip forward if you don't want to see the whole thing. That's what YouTube's for. It's, it's, you know, just skip to the bits you like. You're welcome to do that. So this uh, PTC thermistor, this fuse, this two amp poly switch type fuse, is going from the output of the MOSFET, which has got one leg common to a com rail. Uh, it's got the other leg going through the 
poly switch fuse to the output terminal. I'm always soldering one lead at the moment of these. I could put a few in, I could speed this up a bit. This is where speeding it up let it mess it up as well. This doesn't look too bad in terms of the spacing. The leads didn't take too long to form either, but you know, if, if I was mass producing something like this and I was working to a deadline, that would get quite annoying quite quickly. Been there. There was a awkward night, sudden peaks of work and peaks of orders from my light controllers that you'd be burning the candle at both ends. Not much time for sleep. Falling asleep while soldiering, I've mentioned that in the past. Going into automatic pilot and retracting the soldier iron above the component lead you're forming and falling asleep, then waking up and then carrying on. I think I've got another of these to form, not to worry. Have I? Yes. I divided it into little clusters. Have I got solder in that pad? I have got solder in that pad. That's all right. I'll come back to that one afterwards. I divide it into clusters, uh, partly because this terminal strip is slightly off with the uh, tenth of an inch spacing that I normally use in the circuit board. I think it's metric spacing, so it's that slight shift. Uh, so I prefer to break the strip into se sections. It, it means that it's less likely to try and bend the board to f fit. Or I could get, get the correct size of terminal. This is looking pretty good. Even if I say so myself. Right, hopefully they'll stay put when I tip this upside down. And I shall solder some of those connections. I'm going to zoom back out just a little bit, but very carefully so I don't do what I've done in the past and slide my finger right off the zoom button. Uh, the video will already have cut out uh, 30 minute intervals. Uh, this circuit board so far has taken approximately one hour and approaching 10 minutes, is that? Yeah, it's quite time consuming, but keep in mind it's a one-off. It's the first circuit board. If you were making lots, uh, it would all go together a lot faster, particularly if you had a jig that allowed you to solder a lot more at once. There is that pad that uh, I've accidentally flowed soda on. I'm going to solder one leg of these and then I'm going to make sure they're all aligned up correctly. And if they're not aligned up correctly, then I shall uh, just nudge them a little bit, reheat that joint and just change the angle or just tilt them into position, but without putting too much strain in the leads. I shall, just for variety here, that pad down there that I've put extra solder on, I shall look around and see if I've got my desoldering braid. Because that's another thing I find very useful here. So this is the Gutwick stuff. This is just a copper braid. I'm going to crop it, because it's got solder soaked into it already. I'm going to add a bit of flux. This is, I find this quite important. Some of the stuff comes with enough flux in it, some doesn't. So I'm going to wipe the flux pen on this just to moisten it with flux. And you'll see a wee sort of stain appear on the bench and then sort of dry off a wee bit just to show that that flux went in. And then I'm going to go to this pad here. And the combination of flux and braid will cause the solder to go up into the wick, hopefully leaving a clear pad. In this case, because it's a plated through hole, it has not. So I think I'm going to bring in the solder sucker. This is where I may have to put a new bit of solder in that just to actually give it something to soak. That will also carry the heat down to the other solder down there. This uh, little desoldering pump has a silicon sleeve in the end, just a bit of silicon tubing that does a very good job of mating, mating it down so it can suck it, though, to be honest, it's not sucking. Right, let's uh, try adding a bit of solder on that again. It's all going horribly wrong. The 
most of these cameras uh, do stop. I think it's a file size is the main issue. So roughly every 30 minutes they stop. That's uh, the phone I'm using for recording. And it does, they usually are pretty good. There's only a tiny bit of a slight seam between the recorded sections. This is also needing bent. So I shall uh, bend it. And is this going to go through? Because I'm not sure quite as much soda came out of that as I wanted. I think I may have to heat it to let the lead go through. This is where I make a mess of this. It's possible. The lead is coming through. Okay. Let's uh, not do it there. That's not looking too bad. So I shall solder that one now that I've kind of recovered from that. This circuit is almost complete. All I have to do now is line these up uh, and solder the connection. <clears throat> make sure they're all roughly equal to make it look like I intended it to look like this. Make sure they're not touching the MOSFETs. That's another thing that I should have considered is there. It doesn't really matter because uh, not an awful lot of heat would actually couple through them anyway. Prototypes, they're kind of important prototypes. They let you iron out all the problems and look for things that could occur. I'm a complete pessimist when it comes to that. I always assume the worst. Because uh, if you actually assume the worst, if you look at all the things that could go wrong with something and you allow for them going wrong, it does make things a bit more complex and sometimes a bit more expensive, sometimes a lot more expensive. But um, it just avoids embarrassing incidents, like, say, for instance, a Christmas light and display bursting into flames because there was no overcurrent protection on one of the channels and one piece of shitty Chinese LED neon malfunctioned. Hopefully enough current would flow in this instance to uh, trip the thermal protection in here, the PTC thermistors. I suppose there's one way to find out. <laughs> right, uh, once I've done this, I'm going to put some feet in it. The reason I'm going to put the feet in it is to protect it from uh, sitting on loose metal components because I'm going to be using it the other way up and powering it up. And all this swarf, all this metal stuff on the bench is death to circuit boards. It's really common that people build stuff, they build modules, and then they test them on their bench with all the loose metal clippings around them, and it inevitably shorts stuff out. And if it shorts out a voltage regulator or a, the output stage of something, it can actually cause a lot of damage. So that's why I tend to recommend uh, putting little spacers or feet on. That's something I've noticed with the Chinese modules. They don't really allow for much uh, in the way of mounting feet. They've cut down the size so much that they've not allowed that. In this case, uh, a priority for me and a reason I made the circuit board just a little bit longer than it could have been was to have decent mounting holes, four millimeter holes for push-in plastic spacers. Right. Uh, let's make sure I've soldered all those. Soda, soda, soda. There's always a risk that if you've not soldered one, it might still make a connection and you wouldn't know there was a fault until uh, you had a problem later on when it did make intermittent connection. This circuit board is now quite a heavy, chunky thing, mainly with the terminals and the uh, MOSFETs. One of those leads was notably shorter. Uh, one of the two of those leads were notably shorter. I'm going to have to check that some of those are not. I can adjust them later on for height if they're majorly different. Yeah, that one's a wee bit higher. It doesn't matter. Can you see it? Not really. No, it's fine. Okay, so let's get the feet up. A little tub with terminals. This is uh, what I use for patching some of my kits. My kits go without with these same little spacers. Uh, 
one at each corner. I did consider putting one in the middle, particularly when you're uh, tightening terminals up, but anybody who works in equipment like this will intuitively, they'll try and support circuit boards as they screw terminals in, but not everybody. I always put that in from the wrong side. That would not have helped. I like these little spacers, they're very functional. Terrible to get back out again. Right, uh, microcontroller. So I'm going to put in a bit of software that was used in one of the spaceship consoles off Mission 2110 because it's the same type of software routines I'm going to use. So this was off some random BBC program. And I'm not sure what it is. It just says uh, console, I think it is. Splat console. My guess is it's just going to be random channels coming on and off. Right, tell you what, I'm going to have to pause momentarily. I'm going to have to go and get the neon, uh, dig some out and connect it up. Or do I just uh, go and grab the neon? I shall grab the neon. One moment, please. Let's see how many of these are booby-trapped. Some of these, uh, the sections of the neon that comes with the connectors pre-terminated onto them. Some of them, the polarity is one way and some of the other is the other. The positive usually goes to the back. Right, let's uh, stuff these in. Let's get a little screwdriver. Is this screwdriver going to be small enough? Let's put it in there. And I'll just spread it out along the channels here. Nothing may happen when I put this together. I mean, it's not uncommon for prototypes to fail horribly because you've missed something really obvious or the software might not actually be compatible. It might hold in a reset state. I shall find out. So that's uh, one bit of the neon. Is this in focus? Uh, probably, it's probably in focus enough. Uh, this one has the blue in the bottom. Let's just double check that. Let's check the polarity. I've got my bench power supply here. Which you're going to have to put the current up on. I'm going to turn the uh, power, the solder iron off for quietness. So if this is wrong, then the black to the brown, that, yeah, it was wrong. It's uh, That's the yellow neon. So the polarity is wrong. I have to remember that uh, brown is negative and blue is positive. Another nice thing about these terminals is that because they're rising clamp, when you loosen them, they do go down. They add, you can put a wire straight back into them. You don't have to poke something into them to try and mush that uh, mush that little leaf spring up that they put in them, some of them. Right, there's a bit of neon. There's a, let's get a bit of red. This is just gonna be a whole mess of neon -y effect. So what's this one? This one is the correct way around, I think. We'll find out when I power it up. So let's plug that in there slightly oddly no it's very scruffily terminated i'm not going to if i use this stuff i'm going to be putting my own spikes up the end i'm not going to rely on the ones they provided particularly because i'll be using quite a few circuits of it if this all goes ahead it's one of the things that's going to hold me up here is a bit of material a mesh that i need for the back of it uh, this is the wrong polarity again. Let's check that. So I reckon that blue will be positive. Yep. Okay. So blue is positive. I really don't know how many channels that software is set for. I don't know what will run. We'll find out when we do this. I could answer more questions, although to be honest, right at the moment, we're kind of at the epicenter of testing this. Right, a huge big mess of neon, uh, and I need to get some cables into here. The, I, I'll use smallish cables, it doesn't really matter, it's not going to be mega current. Do I have any decent colours? Yes, I do. There we go. Thickish cables, not super mega thick, but thicker than the other ones. I'm not sure what gauge this is. I've got the uh, RS component stock number. This is from Rap uh, sorry, Rapid Electronics stock number on them. So I could check out its rating. 
The number is 010935 from Rapid Electronics, and there's its matching partner in crime, 010900. Rapid Electronics who still charge me £9 for shipping to the Isle of Man. The bastards! It means that I, I just place less orders with them just because otherwise I have to make a decent order up to justify that. And when other companies like CPC ship free, then the incentive isn't there to use Rapid so much. Rapid's uh, one of those companies that used to be just amazing, so fast with their deliveries. They really lived up to the name of Rapid. And then that whole reduction of hazards and substances thing happened with the lead free. And all the component suppliers were basically, and the manufacturers were put basically under the guillotine because they suddenly overnight had to increase their stock to include the lead free, keep their existing lead based stuff and have the lead free stock, which the manufacturers charged a premium for because they were having to develop. Uh, or just cover the fact that stuff was feeling left, right and centre. So uh, that wasn't... Uh, that was the beginning of the... Well, not the end, but it just made a huge impact. And you could see the effect that had on Rapid at the time. It really put them under a lot of uh, pressure. I'm about to power this up and I hope it's not going to do anything really embarrassing. Uh, I'll also have to check what current the power supply is set for. It's only set for about... Oh, it's set for two amps. What will happen? I don't know what's going to happen here. That's pretty much what I thought might happen. That's The red channel may not be lighting because it may not actually be enabled in the software because this th is a random program. You can see the randomness. Um, shall we turn it on? Let's swap the red to a different channel because it's on the... I think I used this on maybe an 8-channel controller. I'm not really sure. So let's take the red out and stick it in another circuit. Let's just dab the red in random other circuits to see until I find one that's actually active. What about this one up here? That's active. Any speed change would have to be done in the software itself. So let's just bring all this stuff in. Let's uh, loop this across like that. Uh, surround the circuit board in neon, because this is what it's all about. And then turn the overhead light off, and that's going to be very, very ugly and weird. Yeah, that looks all right. I mean, yeah, all right in a sort of psychedelic, really vulgar sense. But the it's proving what I need to know. It's proving that the animation, the, the things working, the program it's running in this is actually switching these. You'll have to imagine, because of what this was originally intended for, that each of these channels, this knee, and it, it was actually just big, huge 12-volt indicators on the front of a spaceship control panel, so they just moved about randomly all the time. Uh, but that looks good. That's a good result. The green is indicating my 12 volts there. The red is indicating my 5 volts there. Uh, the microcontroller's running. Uh, you can also tell from the intensity of the red that it is just 5 volts it's getting. The MOSFETs are all just switching the loads nicely. That's a successful project. So that's a great result. Uh, hope you enjoyed the making of that. The next thing will be putting it into the frame, which I have to cut the aluminium for and join together, and then uh, get that mesh that I was talking about, which is a possibly the deal breaker because I need something to support this rope light on the frame. But uh, this is a good start. That's a great result.